God bless you for what you're going to do. Well, this morning we're going to continue on in our, uh, our C is for Christian series. Uh, last week we talked about being consecrated, which was set apart for Jesus. Uh, and we, we talked the week before that about contending for our faith. And this morning we're going to continue on in the letter C. We're going to talk about committed. Committed. And that subtitle, well, you should be able to read that. Faithful obedience in the same direction. Faithful obedience. It's actually from a phrase from um, Frederick Nietzsche. He, he, he talked about a long obedience in the same direction. You know, in our culture, in our society, um, committed or commitment is not necessarily um, highly valued. Now, we, want, we like people to be committed to us. We like people to be connected to us. We like people to be faithful to us. But uh, it's amazing how quickly people say, I will do this, and then bounce, right? It's amazing how many people will drop you at the drop of, will, will drop you at the drop of a hat. That doesn't work. Will will abandon you at the drop of a hat. Wow. It's, it's amazing. When we look at the statistics, we see in marriage, even within the church, the divorce rate. It doesn't quite equal the world. Now there's those, it depends on how you want to read the studies, but divorce within the church is amazing. You know, once we say I do. You had better do it. Those vows that we take at the altar are a commitment. It's really what I'm talking about this morning is looking at the relationship between us and Jesus as a marriage. Because we are married to Jesus. We are the bride of Christ. Now, I I don't know if you're married, if you have been married, if you haven't been married, if you thought about being married. But how many of you would love for your betrothed to only think about you occasionally? How many of you would think it was great if the person that you were going to marry only paid attention to you when they needed something from you? This is the challenge that we live in the world today, is that many Christians, many of those that call themselves Christian, have gotten themselves into a position where they only really behave like a Christian when they're in need. Now listen, God does care about our need, and He desires the best for us, but it's not really a committed relationship if we only come to God when things are going bad. You wouldn't marry somebody like that, would you? I I certainly wouldn't. Eugene Peterson, in his book, Long Obedience in the Same Direction, he says this, We can decide to live in response to the abundance of God and not under the dictatorship of our own poor needs. This morning I was reading an article from a uh, well-known Christian pastor. His name's Kerry Newhoff. He pastors in Canada. Don't hold that against him. Uh, But he was talking about five cultural trends that are facing the church today that are hurting the success of the church mission. And really, when you look at the five of them, Three of them are almost the exact same. They're just nuances of the same conversation. And here's what the challenge is. This is what's facing the church today. This is what's facing the kingdom of God today, is that the ultimate deciding factor of whether something is valuable, the ultimate deciding factor of whether something is worth doing, the ultimate deciding factor of whether you're going to participate has not It's not based upon what God wants. It's not based upon what is traditionally appropriate. It's not based on anything other than self-value. So somebody has to personally value it. And the ultimate measure has not become culture, has not become the Bible, is not God. It is whether I think I should do it or not. And ultimately, what that leads to is a bunch of inward-looking people that are only concerned about themselves. You know, my my father told me something. Now, I quote my dad a lot because he's, I do really think my dad is a wise, is a wise, I was going to call him a wise guy, but he's actually a wise man. Uh, He's he's very wise. He's got a lot of wisdom to him. And here's what he told me about marriage before uh, Heather and I got married. uh, And it's great advice, and it has served me well. He said, 95% of the time, The reason you're having an argument in your marriage is because one or both of you is trying to be selfish. You want what you want. 
and you're not willing to compromise, adjust, you're not willing to listen to the other person, you're not, now listen, we all have our wants and desires, don't we? We all have things that we want to do. We all have things that we think would be great, would be fantastic. And when we end up in conflict, we have a choice. We can hold on to it. We can dogmatic about it, hard-nosed about it. I'm going to get my way. Or we can find compromise. We find a way to restore that relationship. We find Now, how many of you have ever had to deal with with a three-year-old toddler that has decided the only thing they will eat in life is chicken nuggets. You, you have, have you met that? Yeah, yeah. Sometimes in our relationship with God, we're that three-year-old toddler. God, all I'm going to do is eat chicken nuggets. But I have this wonderful, beautiful steak for you. I understand, but all I want is chicken nuggets with Chick-fil-A sauce, because that's the only way to eat them. But God said, look at all the abundance that I have for you, all the things I can give to you. Yes, God, I understand. I see all those things. It looks wonderful, but it's not chicken nuggets. And we live that kind of life. And while we think we're doing the best thing for ourselves, you know what we're actually doing? is we are, we are shortchanging ourselves of the abundance of God. Shortchanging ourselves from what God could give us because we've decided we like chicken nuggets, we know chicken nuggets are good, and we're going to stick with the chicken nugget. Because there is no more disappointing experience than to go to your favorite restaurant where they have your favorite meal, which apparently in this case is chicken nuggets, and you say, all right, I want to try something new. And that something new is not as good as the old. Right? Have you have, I feel so disappointed when I do that. Heather and I, we, we, we go place, we, the, one of my favorite places in, in, in Fork and River, the German Butcher. Anybody been down there? Yeah, yeah, it's good, Sam. The, their, their Reuben is amazing, right? I always get their Reuben. I always get their Reuben. And Heather, Heather teases me because I always get the same thing the places I go. The last time we went, I decided not to get the room. I said, I I forget what I tried. I forget what I tried. Guess what? It was a very disappointing experience. And I wasted a trip because I didn't get what I always got. I will never do that again. All of us get to that place in our relationship with God where we think we've got all that we are going to get. And we're not going to change it. And so we stick with the chicken nuggets, or in my case, the Reuben. Because it's good, and if you go there, get it. But the fact is, God has so much more. And so this morning, what I want to talk about is being committed in our relationship to Jesus in the same way that we are committed to our spouse, that we're committed to our wants and our desires. Because the fact of the matter is, a strong faith in Jesus does not just happen. That's what we said last week when we were talking about consecrated. It is effort. It is energy, it is a choice that we make as to whether or not we're going to be in a committed relationship with Jesus. James chapter 1, verse 4 and 8 says this, let, per- let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. If any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea, blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person is a double-minded and uh, and unstable in all they do. A committed relationship to Jesus anchors us, anchors us in the faith anchors us in the stability that is presented by being tied to Jesus. How many think that sounds pretty good? I think it sounds great. And so this morning, I've got seven different things in no particular order that we're going to talk about of a committed, characteristics of a committed Christian. Seven different things we're going to talk about. The first thing, 
Characteristic of a committed Christian is surrender. Is surrender. Matthew chapter 16, verses 24 to 25 says this. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if any would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. For whoever loses his life for me will find it. One of the great lies of this world is that you do you. You be who you are is the best advice somebody can be. Follow your heart. This is how many have you heard that one? Follow your heart. That's horrible advice. That's horrible advice because your heart is fickle. It's filled with your wants and desires, but it's filled with your selfish needs and the things that you want, not necessarily what God wants. Listen, even those that are the most saved and sanctified people in this world, they still have selfish desires. They still have those things that they want to do. And I heard somebody say it over here when I talked about the characteristics of a Christian, a a committed Christian. It is a daily choice. It is 100% a daily choice of who we are going to be. Because we wake up in the morning and we have to decide. We have to decide because it would be so easy just to say, you know what? I'm going to do what I want to do. I've had enough of it. I'm going to take one day, just one day, to do what I want to do. How many of you have ever dedicated yourself to a long-term diet? Right? It's a radical thing. Maybe, maybe you said, hey, listen, I, it's time to take off the weight. It's time to do the things i got to do. And you do really good for about a month, right? Three weeks, maybe two weeks, depending, maybe just a week, maybe a day. I don't know. Everyone has a different gauge of what good is when they've ch- decided to do a diet. And maybe they go like this. Listen, I've been hard at work on this. I deserve a cheat day. Right? Right? I, I see the head shaking. Now I, know, now I know the ones that have done this, right? Right? I deserve, for some people, one day committed to a hardcore diet. Says so next day, cheat day. Some people it takes two weeks, three weeks, doesn't matter. I, I know I've told you this before, but They've, they've done studies and found that the uh, New Year's resolutions, they typically last till the second week of February, and then it's done. But how many of you have you have done this? You don't have to raise your hand or shake your head. The cheat day becomes like, oh, you, you wake up the next morning, you're like, oh, yeah, I forgot I was on a diet. I shouldn't have started the day with three Dunkin' Donuts. That, that's bad. Well, I've already messed up. I might as well make it another cheat day, right? Then the next day, you're like, oh, I forgot I was on a diet again. I shouldn't have gone to IHOP, but I did. Well, I might as well just finish the day out like that. And before you know it, that cheat day becomes a cheat week, becomes a cheat ma- ma- month, becomes the diet was actually the anomaly. <laughs> it, was just like, it was a week of trying good, right? That's why the surrender to Jesus has to be absolute, and it has to be daily. What's it say? It says, deny himself. And take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. For whoever loses his life for me will find it. But it's like those chicken nuggets. We're not actually sure if that's true. Does God have better for me than where I'm at right now? The answer is yes. The answer is yes. But you have to make that choice to surrender. Without the surrender, the other six things, and listen, I've got seven things here. There's way more than seven things that a, a committed Christian does. These are just the ones I figured I could get in in the next two hours. And so we, we know there's all sorts of things we do. Listen, we don't just drift through life as Christians, do we? Man, we've got to check in with Jesus all the time. Some people just, they, they weigh out in a scientific process, okay, for a new job. Is this money going to improve the condition of my house? Am I going to be able to work the hours? Am I going to be able to do this? We as Christians, we throw one more criteria on there. Is this what God wants for me? Is this what God wants for me? Well, that's a big one, isn't it? And once, once we actually throw, is this what God wants, on me, wants for me? The other ones, 
about the money, the time, all those things, that goes away. Because if it's what God wants for me, then the rest of that doesn't matter, does it? The rest of it doesn't matter. That's what true surrender looks like. True surrender looks like doing things that doesn't make sense to other people because God has directed you to do it. Surrender. Lose the life that you think you deserve and give it to Jesus and allow him to show you that he has better. That's what true surrender looks like. The Bible tells us that the way seems right to a man. But we know that God's ways are not our ways and his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. Surrendering daily opens us up to the abundance of God. Second thing that we need to commit ourselves to as Christians is witness. We need to share the gospel of who Jesus Christ is. We need to tell other people the gospel of who Jesus Christ is. Now, I'm not saying that you need to stand on a street corner with a bullhorn and shout at people. I don't know that a whole lot of people have gotten saved by you shouting at them. But I do think you need to be willing to talk to them when they are here when they are there and ready to hear the gospel. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 16 to 27 says this, Yet when I preach the gospel, I cannot boast, for I am compelled to preach. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. If I preach voluntarily, I have a reward. If not voluntarily, I am simply distrusting or discharging the trust committed to me. What then is my reward? Just this, that in preaching the gospel, I may offer it free of charge, and so not make use of my rights in preaching it. Though I am free and belong to no man, I make myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. To the Jews, I become like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I become like the one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I become like one not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. To the weak, I become weak to win the weak. I have become all things to all men so that by all possible means I, will ha- I might save some. I do this for the sake of the gospel that I may share in its blessings. Do you not know that all run in a race, the all, the all that run, run in a race, all the runners run, but only one gets the prize. Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last. But we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like a man running aimlessly. I do not fight like a man beating the air. No, I beat my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. The most powerful line in this, the most powerful line in this, I have become all things to all men so that by all possible means, I might save some. Too often when we're telling other people about Jesus, we are concerned about how we desire to tell them. Some people are much more confrontive in in the nature of their gospel. Some people, they want to tell them like like, like almost with a, a military style of this is, these are the marching orders, this is what you do. But if somebody's, tender-hearted and gentle. That's not going to transform their lives. You talk about how Jesus has changed your life, how Jesus has transformed your life, how you are different. You connect with people. You have so many more doors of opportunity. But you have to understand this, and anybody that has ever been public speaker, has ever written anything, you understand there's always multiple interpretations, right? So you have the speaker, they, they think they're saying one thing. You have the listener that thinks they're hearing one thing. And then you have the afterwards where everyone gets together and say, and they kind of do their own little interpretation. It's, I can't tell you how many times I've had somebody come to me after a message and say, Pastor Spencer, when you said this, it really spoke like this to me. And I looked at, I'm, I'm thinking to myself, that's not at all what I meant. You have to recognize it's not about how you desire to communicate it. Paul said, I have become all things to all men so that I might win some. When he was in Athens, when Paul was in Athens, and he went to the circle of where all the philosophers lived, where they, where they debated things, he took up 
the, known, the, the unknown God. And Paul, in the midst of these uh, philosophers who would stand around in, in this area and they would, they, would, they would wax eloquently and they would come up with deep philosophies and thoughts, Paul took a known topic, which was the unknown God, and he presented the case for Jesus. He had to recognize the community and the context where he was at. But a committed Christian looks for opportunities to share about Jesus. They look for opportunities to tell others about Jesus. And if you are unsure of how to do that, the best way I can encourage you is to find relationships with people and then tell them the stories of what Jesus has done in your life. Show them love, show them goodness, show them grace, but show them Jesus and your life transformed. Because when you do that, you might not win all of them, but you will certainly win some of them. And it will give you an opportunity to grow the kingdom of God, not for your own glory, not for your own benefit, but for the benefit of the person you're ministering to and for the glory of God. Characteristic of a committed Christian is a strong witness, a consistent witness, a clear witness. Another one is generosity. Generosity. Now, we talk about giving generously each, each week when we do our tithes and offering, and I've got to tell you, you do a wonderful job of that. But generosity is more than just giving of your money, giving of your time, giving of your energies, giving of your efforts, giving of your talents. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6 to 15, it says, Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctant or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, he has scattered and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed, will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be made rich in every way so that you can be generous in every occasion. And through you, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of God's people, but it is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Because of the service by which you have proved yourself, men will praise God for the obedience and that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ. For your generosity in sharing with them, with everyone else, and in your prayers for, their, for you, their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace God has given you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. That portion of Scripture has been used on a regular basis in regards to tithing and offerings, and I do believe it applies there. But as you listen to it, don't you think it applies beyond just financial contribution? Giving of your gifts, your talents, your abilities, giving of yourself. It is a matter of just as Jesus described himself as poured out. We pour out of ourselves. You know, I highlighted some of our grounds crew. Uh, and they do a great job. Listen, most of us don't even realize when they're here because they, you, know, you work a long day, you work a hard day, you're tired. We have a group of people who do the same thing, but they find time to come mow acres, mow the, the uh, medians out there in the parking lot. They pick weeds. They do things. They do things here at the church that I don't like doing at my own house. I trimmed hedges yesterday, took me four hours, and I was not happy at all. But here are people that come and do it at the church. Why? Because they're generous. They're generous with their time. They're generous with their talents. They're generous with themselves. I think of our worship team, and I know we see them each and every week, but our worship teams, they're here every Tuesday practicing, Sunday mornings. I think of the children's workers that we never see, but serve. I think Pastor Joe Manning, he's not here today, he's on vacation, um, but I, th I think he's done a wonderful job in the, the two months that he's been with us, almost three months that he's been with us. He's, he's got the toddler room open. 
How did that happen? He got the toddler room open because other people grabbed a hold of the opportunity to serve, and they gave generously of their time. Churches are unique places. We have a lot of work that we do. We have a lot of uh, ministry that we do. But churches are so interesting and and so unique because we are an entirely volunteer-driven organization. We have a few paid staff members, obviously, um, but we have... But not only do our volunteers do the majority of the work, our volunteers pay for the work. Your generosity is what allows a church to function. Your generosity is what allows a church to grow. Your generosity is what allows us to do the ministry of God's kingdom. And I want to tell you, if you don't think it matters when you show up for a couple hours on a Saturday, you're wrong. It's absolutely essential because it takes all of us to do the work that God has called to us, called us to. So your generosity and giving your generosity and serving your generosity and pouring out of yourself is absolutely essential to who we are as a church. But even more than that, it's absolutely essential to fulfilling the call of God. You are ministers in and of yourselves. And you do a great job. I'm so proud of you. The next thing that everyone's committed that a committed Christian is. Uh, They're committed to fellowship and worship. Fellowship and worship. This past week we had a uh, we had a barbecue. Um, It was it was the hottest day of the week on Wednesday, Uh, but you can't predict that, can you? Uh, We had about thirty five, forty people came out. It was a wonderful time. There was there was no real program. There were a lot of water balloons thrown around. I'm thankful that uh, they did not get me. I I hate getting wet uh, when it's not on purpose, and so. But it was a fun time. And you know what the highlight was? Just being able to talk to people. Just being able to hear how they're doing. You know, I mean, Ross did a great job. Where are you at? Ross did a great job on the grill. We appreciate the people that serve. But the highlight wasn't the food. The highlight wasn't even the water balloon fight. The highlight was just getting to be with people. We were not designed to live life alone. Fellowship. You know one of the best ways for us to fellowship? Here you are. Sunday mornings, be before service, after service. Listen, when you come to church, when I say amen at the prayer, don't make a beeline out the door, okay? Go get a cup of coffee. Stand around, talk to the people around you. You might not know the people around you. We can do another name tag Sunday if we need to. But it gives you an opportunity to build fellowship and relationship. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19 to 23, it says this, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most high holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us the curtain that is his body. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from guilty consciences and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. And let us not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. But let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. You know, oftentimes we mistake worship with singing. Now, that is part of our praise and that is part of our worship. But, you know, worship is our giving. Worship is our loving. Worship is our relationship to one another. Worship is how we live our lives daily and obediently to Jesus. That is an act of worship. When we talk about our tithes and offering, we talk about that as an act of worship. But have you ever considered serving in ministry as an act of worship? Have you considered going to be part of a small group? And building relationship as an act of worship. Have you considered your prayer is an act of worship? Worship is more than singing. Because sometimes when we we, we boil worship down to just singing, we think, I can't sing well, therefore I don't enjoy, quote unquote, worship. I've known many, not necessarily here, but I know many church members that our our, our church in Virginia, we had people that would skip worship. They didn't enjoy the worship style. They didn't enjoy, and they would just come just for the message because they said, I don't, I don't enjoy worship. What have they in their mind equated worship to? Just singing. Worship, fellowship, 
relationship, living daily for Jesus, that is what worship is. How we share Jesus is part of our worship. How we think of others, how we love others, how we dedicate ourselves is part of our worship. At verse 25 in Hebrews, it says, Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. This is what I, wrote, I love. But let us encourage one another. And all the more as you see the day approaching. You know what the day is, right? It's the day of Jesus' return. How many of you think Jesus' Jesus's return is closer today than it was last week? Well, it is. It is. Jesus' return is close. Do I know when it is? I do not. Do I have any inkling? Am I giving you kind of any prophetic guidance? I am not. But here's what I know. Jesus is coming back. And the day and time that we are living in is getting increasingly evil, which is one of the indicators that his return is imminent. What should we do? Encourage one another even all that much more because the day is approaching. The day is approaching. This one seems kind of obvious, but it's amazing how frequently people don't, um, don't live by this. But uh, committed Christians, they commit themselves to the Word and to prayer. To the Word of God and to the Word of prayer. I'm not going to read all the verses here that I have, but I've got three references for you. I've got uh, John, uh, Joshua 1, verses 7 and 9, John 15, 7 and 8, but I'm going to read Ephesians. Ephesians says this, Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. Listen. The Word of God, the Bible is not simply a story. The Bible is God's gift and His Word to us that allow us to see the redemptive ark that He has created for us. You see in the beginning that we were in relationship with God. World sinned, people sinned, Adam and Eve sinned, everyone followed with them. But how many times, I talked last week about Samson and the judges. Again, Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. And when Israel did evil, what did God do? He raised up a judge to deliver them. When the people of God departed from his desires and his will, what did he do? He drew them back. Sometimes it was in somewhat uh, strong, corrective manners, but other times it was through provision and abundance. And ultimately, we know that the way that God drew people back unto himself was through the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. Jesus took that redemptive ark and he actually makes it a circle so that we can restore the relationship that we had with Jesus. But where does that come? It comes in the Word. It comes in prayer. Where do we see that spelled out for us? We see it spelled out for us. In the Word of God. Now listen, we are an Assemblies of God church. We are a Pentecostal church. We believe in the work of the Holy Spirit. We believe in modern day utterances of the Holy Spirit. We believe in all of this. But there are some that are Pentecostal that they place a modern day utterance or the leading of the Holy Spirit over the Word of God. And here's what I've got to tell you. If somebody has ever heard a word that does not align with the Bible, they have not heard the Word of God. The Bible is the ultimate authority in our lives. Now, I I have seen this this acronym, Basic Instructions Before Leaving Earth. Um, I don't know if that's a really good acronym because like an instruction book tells you, step one, do this. Step two, do that. How many of you would love it if the Bible would tell you, okay, in this situation, all right, so you've got a coworker that's a pain in your rear, and nobody will do anything about it. Step one, do this. Step two, do that. Step That's not how it works, is it? You have to look at the Bible in its entirety. Why? 
Because that's where you find the nature and the character of God. That's where you find Jesus, is when you look at the wholeness. And we recognize, listen, I, I've, 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 I've heard this said. People say, I, you know, I really like Jesus. But, but God, in the Old Testament, he was like burning things down, turning people into salt. He flooded the world. And they have separated God and Jesus, when in actuality, God and Jesus both speak of the nature of God. Because as much as God is love and he desires to be in deep relationship with us and he desires to be in presence, at the end of the day and at the end of our time, guess what? There are going to be millions upon millions of people that end up in hell. Not because God does not love them, but because they have chosen to reject the love of God. The word and prayer, Christians, we have to be committed to it so that we can understand fully who he is. Number six, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time because I'm, I'm running out of time here, but number six, a committed Christian. They are committed to repentance, reconciliation, and grace. John 1, verses, uh, 1 John 1, 7 and 9 says this, But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with others, and the blood of Jesus, his Son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, and he will forgive us of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Listen, Jesus has forgiven you completely and wholly, but here's the truth is that you are going to continue to mess up. If you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are going to continue to make mistakes. You are going to continue to sin. Repentance is an ongoing process in our lives. Repentance is an ongoing process. Is it because we are on the edge of losing God's uh, favor? No, it's because we want to show ourselves wholly surrendered and fully, completely given to Him. And so we recognize our shortfalls. We recognize, and in the Scriptures and in our, in our, in our terminology, we call that process sanctification, where we are com committed to repenting of those things. Listen, we don't want to make the same mistake over and over and over again. We, if we're going to make a mistake, let's make it a new mistake. But it also shows us where the opportunity is for us to continue to pursue the forgiveness of God. And be transformed. Be transformed in that repentance. At the same time, at the same time, God has given us a message of reconciliation. 2 Corinthians 5.19 says this, God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sin, men's sin against them, and he was committed to us, he, and he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. See, the message of repentance tells us repentance is turning 180 degrees and going the other direction. That is what repentance means. But reconciliation helps us to frame the conversation so that people can understand that you were at one point, you had access to God, and because of sin, sin separated us from God, but because of repentance and the reconciliation and the desire of God to be in relationship with you, that can be restored. See, if we just look at the sin, we can become legalistic. We can become hard-nosed. We can say, if you don't fill out, if you don't follow point one, two, three, four, five, and 6, you have no opportunity to make it to heaven. Listen, our salvation, our repentance is not just insurance to get into heaven. The whole point of repentance is to reconcile our relationship to Jesus so that we can be in a deeply committed Go back to that marriage analogy. Committed and loving, long-term relationship with God. You're the bride of Christ. Be reconciled to Him. Be reconciled to Him. Reconcile. Tear, tears down the division. Tear down the separation. Re reconciliation and grace. Grace is this. I, I, I did this one as a kid, teenager. You see in the Bible, oftentimes it, it talks about grace and mercy. Grace and mercy. And grace, grace and mercy are oftentimes used hand in hand. Grace is the generosity of God covering your sin. 
generosity of God covering your sin. But we, as Christians, are called to be committed to grace as well. And grace for us is no different than what grace means for God. It's us loving people where they are. It's extending God's hand. It's extending our love. Even though somebody might be, I mean, I mean you know them, they're rough around the edges. They, they still drop F-bombs periodically. They still are very harsh, hard, and difficult to get along with. But for whatever reason, they have decided you are their friend. And you extend grace to them. You overlook their shortcomings and their flaws. You overlook those things that are unbiblical. And you continue to pray for them. You continue to show them God's love. Your grace opens the doors for other people to receive his grace. We're never called to be the judge. We're not. Some people feel very justified in doing it. We, uh, on Tuesday, as part of the staff, we talked about primary leadership axioms or uh, sayings that we repeat to ourselves, key verses that we have. Um, One of the ones that I continue to repeat for myself, and I think everyone would benefit from it, but for the grace of God go I. I'm a sinner saved by grace. I have a very distinct advantage over many people in the fact that I was born into a Christian home with loving parents that cared for me and loved me, took me to church every week, whether I wanted to go or not. But it's because of the grace of God that I'm where I'm at. It's like a turtle on a fence post. You know, the turtle didn't get there by itself. Neither did I. Neither did you. The grace that we extend to others opens the door for them to receive God's grace. The last thing this morning that I wanted to share was a Christian is committed to the mission. What's the mission of God? The mission of God is to go and make disciples. The Great Commission. 1 Peter 4, verses 10 and 11 says this, Each one should use whatever gifts he has received to serve others faithfully administrating administering God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, he should do it as one speaking the very words of God. If anyone serves, he should do it with the strength God provides so that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and power forever and ever. Amen. We live a life that is called by Jesus and that is called by God to Share his truth. And my fear for so many people is that they have disrupted, misrepresented, and twisted the truth of God for their own purpose. They haven't shown that God is love. They've presented a God that is harsh and judgmental. Now, don't don't take that wrong. At the end of time, God will judge. But what's the Bible tell us? That he desires that all would come to know him. Not some, but all. We as a church have to be committed to what God desires for us. There's an old song about not wanting to be a casual Christian. And if I'd had more forethought, I would have had the worship team uh, prepare it, but I don't know that they know it. I don't want to be a casual Christian. I don't want to live a lukewarm life. But I want to light up the night with your everlasting light. You know, it's, it, it is this concept that says in every day, every decision, every moment, I am committed to representing Jesus. I am committed to showing other people Jesus And it goes back to that first verse that we shared. What do we have to do? Surrender. Deny yourself. And allow Jesus to shape you, to mold you, to make you, and to use you to declare his glory around this world.
And here's what I know. You can do it. Not by your own power, not by your own energy, energy and efforts, but by through the strengthening and the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life, you can be the committed Christian God desires for you to be. And that's my prayer for you today. You bow your heads, let me pray. Father, this morning, there's so much to living this Christian life. It can at times feel overwhelming. Am I going to please God? Am I going to live a life that honors you? And if we focus just on the what and not who you are, we can feel defeated because of our own shortcomings. But we know that it's through you and by you that we are made whole. And so this morning, Jesus, even beyond this list of seven things, I pray that you would help us to live as committed Christians, not casually taking day by day, but committedly focusing on your desires and wants for us so that we might honor you. But more than that, we might help people find you. So Jesus, this morning, I pray for your people. I pray for myself. Help me. Help me to honor you. Help me to remain committed to you. Jesus, I desire to be the man that you desire to me to be. And it is my desire for this church to be the body you've called us to be. And so to let us live as the pure, spotless bride of Christ, ready for our bridegroom to come back, committed to that which you desire for us. Bless us this morning. In your precious name we pray. Amen. 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 Will you stand with me? No one ever said living a Christian life is easy. But here's the great beauty of it. You don't have to live it alone. You don't have to live it by yourself. Look at all these people around you. They, they desire to do the same thing you do. Live a Christian life that honors God. And you might not know them, but guess what? You get the opportunity to. Take your time. Fellowship with each other after church. Go introduce yourself to somebody you've never seen. As iron sharpens iron, we encourage one another. But more than that, it's a choice that we make to be dedicated to the commitment every single day. And it is possible to do. In just a moment, I'm going to pray a prayer of blessing on you. When I do that, I'm going to, after I say amen, I want to encourage you as the friends, my friends from the prayer team come forward. If you need prayer today, maybe it's something about what I talked about, but maybe it has nothing to do with anything I spoke about today. If you need prayer today, I want to invite you to come down for prayer. My friends from the prayer team will be down here. You know, we're faced with different challenges every day. God knows your need. He knows the depth of your challenge. He wants to be in relationship with you. Give him the opportunity to be in the midst of that situation. Just want to remind you, we've got plenty of things to sign up for out at the Big Blue Wall. Love to have you join us for the High Point Outreach, July 30th, so that's next Saturday. Sign up out at the Big Blue Wall so we can contact you, follow up with a little information. Grab a flyer for the uh, materials that we are co collecting for servicemen. We would love to have that. Next Sunday is the last Sunday that we're going to receive those. We want to bless people. We want to bless you. And more than anything, really, I want you to be a blessing to others. So I'm going to pray. When I say amen, if you need prayer, please come forward. My friends will be down here. Do me a favor. Lift your hands to heaven. Let me bless you today. Jesus, I pray as you bless your people. Bless them in their coming and their going. Bless them in their homes. Bless them in their families. Bless them in their neighborhoods and their workplaces. Jesus, I pray you bless your people with a deep and abiding commitment to follow you, to surrender to you, to be wholly submitted to your desire for them. I pray, Jesus, this morning that you would help us by your Holy Spirit 
to be who you have called us to be. Jesus, this morning, be with us. Bless your people as they go from this place and let them be a blessing to others that they come in contact with. Father, we know it's going to be a great week. You're going to go ahead of us. You're going to open doors. You're going to pave the way. And I pray this morning that you would bless your people as they go. Bless them so that they may be a blessing to others. It's in your precious heavenly name we pray. Amen.